Yeah, so AIM listed company and our business is uh, developing medicines to prevent infections. We obviously just heard a lot around the impact of COVID and there is a direct read across to what Destiny has been doing uh, in, this, in sort of bacterial infections and infection prevention. But we also have our own um, COVID project, which is backed by a grant from the UK government. Uh, our team, um, obviously myself, Neil Clark, I presented before at uh, Shares Magazine event. So uh, uh, pleased to be here again in this virtual format. Our founder, Bill Love, founded the company 20 years ago as our CSO. And as you'd expect, we have a, a full complement of um, talented executives and a very strong non-executive board, including uh, Dr. Wajing Peng, who uh, lives in Kent, but is uh, our board member from our China partner, China Medical Systems, who came in and invested in Destiny at our IPO um, three years ago, or over three years ago in the autumn of 2017. Oops, sorry, it's gone too fast. So uh, the next slide is our plan. So we have a five-year plan to build a much larger company. And it, I think, again, I will refer to the, the pandemic, but it is a reference point across the life science uh, industry. And there has been a, you know, a fantastic response, of course, from uh, healthcare professionals across uh, various sectors, but including uh, pharma companies, Hannity Biotechs. And I think it gives more credibility to aimlessly companies like ourselves that have much more ambitious plans to build you know, larger companies, as, as you perhaps see more in, in, in uh, the US. And indeed, uh, we announced today the sale of GW Pharmaceuticals to Jazz Pharma for, I think it was several billions. I remember seeing GW back in 2008 when it was two, two people and a laptop and a license to some cannabis in, uh, in Kent. So we have a big uh, plan to build a bigger company. We're focusing on infection prevention. Uh, we like the hospital care home markets. Uh, and we have two platforms. We have our long-standing XF platform, which has a lead asset, uh, XF73, that's finished a phase 2B study and reporting data uh, at the end of Q1. That will be in March. So that's obviously very exciting news flow around the corner. And also last year, you would have seen that we brought in two new technologies, which are in this world of the microbiome, naturally occurring biotherapeutics. One is a phase three ready program and one is an earlier um, COVID targeted program, which was uh, supported by a UK government grant. So we have shown we can expand the pipeline. And this, of course, along with bringing through in, in house assets will generate the value and drive us forward to our ultimate goal of being a, a much larger company with products on the market and an exciting pipeline. And, and we truly believe, as we're all, I'm afraid, have learned the very hard way in the last 12 months that prevention is very much better than cure. Um, and the backdrop uh, to Destiny, we've been in this area of infection prevention for 20 years. It's fair to say it's been unfashionable. Um, we'll all be aware of uh, going back to the 1940s, uh, Fleming and, and penicillin. Um, and there were several similar um, discoveries over the next decades of novel uh, mechanisms of action and new approaches. But it's fair to say that since the 70s and 80s, there's been a lack of innovation in this space. Big Pharma have backed out because there's been perhaps easier uh, therapeutic uh, markets to target, oncology, cardiology, rare diseases, orphan drugs. But the fact is that COVID has highlighted clearly the need to address um, infections and how to treat them. And obviously COVID is a virus. Uh, we're, we are largely in the area of bacterial infections, but many, many of these respiratory viral infections are associated with bacterial infections. And again, we, we're seeing a real read across to what we're doing. It's highlighted COVID, the lack of innovation and novel products in this space. And this is coming through in new government initiatives in the US with the Pasteur Act and the UK government, where they're actively supporting not only the development through clinical studies of drugs, but also commercial support as drugs hopefully come to the market. And also a billion dollar AMR action fund being set up by pharma to invest in clinical studies. So across the board, there's a really exciting, uh, fast moving um, environment, which is supporting companies like ourselves that are in this space and bringing forward new drugs, which are sorely needed. So at a glance, as, as we've seen, we have this clear focus, but importantly, in terms of value, as hopefully as existing or potential shareholders, we have assets. So we have two late stage clinical assets, um, both targeted at clear markets and with um, you know, markets approaching globally a billion dollars for peak sales, so large markets. And our lead program from our XF platform XF73, as I said, is due to report data at the end of Q1. 
this year. This is to prevent post-surgical infections caused by Staphylococcal aureus. Uh, and an example of such an infection is MRSA, MRSA, which is a very nasty infection that you can pick up after surgery. But we also now have another uh, asset which has completed its phase two program. So it's ready to go forward towards phase threes, which is what, what we're doing this year. We acquired that in uh, December last year. We closed the funding round. And this is to prevent a, a gut infection caused by toxic strains of a bacteria called C. difficile. And there's great phase two package there that we've acquired. And again, taking that forward uh, th through towards its phase three program. And we also have an earlier uh, pipeline, including our, our COVID project funded by a grant. So decent cash position. So we have working capital through to the back end of 2022. And so we're in a very good place as we as we come into 2021 with exciting news around the corner. And the pipeline, as you can see in green, we have our two sort of microbiome or biotherapeutic projects. Now, this is a very exciting area of science. There's lots of work going on to show how the, the bugs uh, that are on us, in us, how they can affect our overall biology and, and health. Uh, and people are, are taking forward treatments to help with uh, oncology and also neurology disorders. We have two candidates here that are focused very much at prevention of infections. NTCDM3 is for the prevention of the C. difficile infections. Spore cob is actually a stimulant to our nasal immune system to act as a first line preventative treatment uh, to stop obviously the, the sort of the, the, the uh, viruses such as coronavirus, COVID-19 and indeed influenza viruses from, from um, um, absolutely getting into our respiratory system. So this is a novel approach uh, stimulating the lining of the nose. So that's um, underway, as I said, preclinical project government grant. But in the blue, you'll see our XF portfolio, the nasal program reporting data in two months. Uh, which actually no, it's next month now, isn't it? It's March, which is uh, targeting this prevention of post-surgical staphylococcal infections. Uh, we've been awarded US, US QIDP and fast track status. So that's the FDA recognizing the quality of our asset. And uh, so exciting clinical data around the corner, but longer term, I think those who've seen us present before, uh, the addition in second half of last year of the two green programs has really added some breadth and depth to the, the pipeline. And, and this is an indication of what we can do we had support from shareholders, including our existing China shareholder, and uh, very excited about the potential in the pipeline and, and the prospects of growing growing the company further, driven by success, of course, in, in the clinic with uh, the two lead clinical programs in the short term. Uh, I won't dwell on the pictures too long. It's dinner time for some of us. Um, but when we get an infection in a wound after a surgery, uh, it's nasty, it's costly, and it uh, obviously damages the patient recovery. And uh, in terms of post-surgical infections caused by Staph aureus, it's still the, the largest cause of, of post-surgical infections. Uh, and it's caused by the Staph aureus that we that live in our noses. So a third of the world are carriers of Staph in the nose. Day to day, it's no problem. But you do have a 10 times greater risk if you're going for a hospital operation of, uh, of that uh, nasal carriage uh, getting across and infecting uh, the open wound as you're operated on and there's 10 times greater risk of post-surgical infection. So the market's large because there's many millions of uh, surgical operations, 40 million uh, plus in the US alone. And of course, a third of patients going in for those surgeries are at risk uh, from this post-surgical infection and increased risk due to this nasal carriage. There is no approved drug in the US. Uh, an old Glaxo antibiotic is used. Uh, that antibiotic is approved in, in, in Europe, but it has problems. And one of the big problems is it has is it generates resistance. Uh, the generate and resistance, uh, when you see it in bacteria, leads to superbugs. And of course, superbugs are hard to treat, if not impossible in certain cases. And this, this rise of the superbug and antimicrobial resistance is another global healthcare concern. It was mentioned by Matt Hancock in his uh, talk uh, presentation he gave in advance of the G7 just the other day. He obviously talked about the coronavirus pandemic, but also addressed the global threat of AMR, antimicrobial resistance. And the XF platform clearly diff uh, addresses this. Uh, we don't see resistance with XF73 in the studies we've done. So this, this gives us a clear advantage alongside its, its other attributes in terms of it's very safe, fast and effective. So data coming from this program in the next quarter. I said there is this uh, competitor, as you, if you like, which is not approved in the US. It's an old antibiotic, but it needs to be given five days before surgery. There's real problems with resistance uh, with mupiracin. It's one of those old antibiotic classes, which does lead to, to the rise of, uh, of superbugs. So real advantages for XS73. And obviously, we're looking for that phase two data 
to drive us through uh, towards phase threes and uh, that very exciting value inflection point. A chart here on the on the resistance profile uh, showing us uh, along the bottom there that you don't see resistance in these academic studies um, with uh, our, our drugs from the XF platform compared to traditional antibiotics. Again, a key attribute of the class as it moves into the clinic. There's various academic papers also supporting our claims, independent to Destiny Pharma, highlighting the problems of mupirizin resistance, but also in the middle there, the US Cardiac Surgeons Surgery Society recommending that all patients going in for surgery are decolonized. So every one of us who's unlucky enough to go in for a hip replacement or some cardiac surgery, you would automatically have our drug as a nasal gel before the surgery, the day of surgery, to kill the bacteria in your nose for that period of risk. Uh, the plan, of course, complete the phase two, We'll have discussions with the FDA, finalise the phase three designs, and then we're looking to uh, start that phase three study in 2022. So uh, you know, not too far away from the end game. In, in parallel, we're, of course, we'll continue to such discussions with partners. We have our China partner, partner, and we're looking to find other partners to join us on the journey and to lead the commercialisation of our assets. And just moving on now to the other uh, lead program we have, which is this compound NTCDM3. Well, it's actually not a compound, it's a, it's a bacterial spore. The NT stands for non-toxigenic. And what this is looking to do is to be taken as an oral uh, treatment to prevent the recurrence of C. difficile infections, which is uh, pre-COVID was the leading cause of hospital acquired infections in America. So a major pathogen, which is poorly treated, uh, affecting especially elderly care home patients who uh, uh, have um, are, are weak and easily uh, attacked by the toxic strains of the C. diff in the gut, especially when their gut microbiome is disrupted by the use of oral antibiotics. So this is a condition which, uh, although it can be treated first line by antibiotics, the antibiotics also um, can exacerbate the condition because they damage the microbiome. And there's many cases in a large market in the US and this bacteria lives on us, in us, around us. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, when you do get an outbreak of the toxic strains, it can spread very widely through the feces and uh, door handles, etc. And you get, as you've seen with COVID, you can get uh, wide outbreaks in the hospitals, care homes, especially in the elderly. And unfortunately, though the antibiotics can knock back the first line infection, there's high incidence of recurrence. And then you get into this cascade of multiple recurrence. And you're talking about patients who are having three to 11 episodes of diarrhea a day alongside uh, their other conditions uh, and bearing in mind that most of them are very elderly as well. So a very nasty uh, condition, which is poorly treated. And we've managed to license this package, which is the, uh, a non-toxic strain of C. diff, which was developed by Professor Girding in the US which effectively is taken and acts as a ground cover and, and will proliferate in the gut and prevent the toxic strains from growing. So a very neat solution, harnessing a, a naturally occurring bacterial spore, NTCD, actually exists in around 3% of the Western population. Uh, and so it's introducing this into patients who are at risk or suffering from these infections. And its data from its phase two studies has shown that it prevents the recurrence of C. difficile, a 95% prevention, which is uh, data we believe which is much better than anyone else uh, in this play in this marketplace is delivering it's a large market especially in the US but there are global opportunities and as part of our due diligence before we acquired the asset we got clarity on the phase three plans from the US in July last year so we're looking this year to develop the manufacturing uh, set it up again and then start the phase three in 2022 uh, and uh, very strong phase two data as I said and the clear clarity from the FDA on the 800 patient phase three that is required. We'll be looking to carry out this study in the US and Europe. And uh, as I said, if we're successful here, this is a target market, which is a peak sales of, we believe, of $200 million for the main uh, market here, the prevention of recurrence, but there are also line extensions into primary prevention, the multiple recurrence market, and also, of course, a global opportunity into Europe and Asia. So it's a breakthrough, very well positioned, and it's a preventative approach. So it's a perfect fit with our uh, strategy with XF73, albeit a totally different uh, molecule. Uh, well, it's not a molecule, as I said, it's actually a live bacterial spore, but it does also move us into this exciting area of the human microbiome, which is a very fashionable space. So again, we're, we're broadening our pipeline and by the through the diversification, of course, we've reduced the risk in being exposed very much just to one um, a lead asset, which is XS73, which we're still very happy with. But of course, it's great to have two shots on goal now. And indeed, coming through, we have earlier assets, Sporkov. Uh, we won an £800,000 
grant from the UK, Innovate UK, uh, last summer with Sporgen, our partners. So this is a 50-50 share we have in this asset, and we're taking this through um, early research now. But uh, as we come into 2022, we'll be looking to go into human studies. And again, it's a very neat, uh, low-cost, stable approach which could be used as a therapy alongside vaccines or indeed independently, potentially, to prevent um, viral infections, uh, coronavirus-type infections, COVID-19, and indeed influenza. And again, we have earlier partnerships, grant funding uh, on our XF platform, um, over two and a half million pounds worth we've won in the last two or three years with various UK and indeed Chinese universities. Our strategy on licensing, we have a partner in China, but we're now looking to, uh, as we get into the later stage assets and clinical studies, looking to find partners uh, for XS73 and NTCDM3. You may have seen that we've appointed a chief business officer, Dr. Stephanie Buick, just a couple of weeks ago. So we've beefed up our capability there and are looking forward again to making further progress in 2021 on, uh, on seeking partners. And news flow, obviously the exciting news flow around the corner is the uh, data from our phase 2B study, XS73. Uh, the rest of this year we'll be finalising plans for uh, uh, M3 and of course XS73 after what we're expecting to be good phase 2 data and indeed uh, looking at uh, closing one or more partnering deals. And as we head into next year, we'll be looking to start phase threes uh, with XF73 and NTCD M3, which is a fantastic opportunity for UK biotech. I'd struggle to think of other uh, companies listed on AIM who have this opportunity. Obviously, we, we need to get through that phase two data next month. But if we do, this is a, you know, a great achievement for the company. And we really are then well placed to deliver significant value as we move forward. So in summary, Infection prevention, you know, prevention is better than cure, as we're all, we're all learning perhaps the hard way. Um, and two late stage assets, which are very well positioned, well focused. Uh, we believe they're clearly differentiated from competition where it exists. There is no competition for XS73 in America, effectively, because there's no approved product. We have an exciting earlier pipeline, and we've got a good funding position, a, a good China partner, strong board, and uh, we're very excited about 2021. Thank you. Um, you, one of the last words you mentioned there was funding, and um, so I'll start at that point. A question here: uh, it says you've got funding until the end of 2022, um, and then income um, forecast from 2024. Is that correct? Um, and how will you finance that gap? Well, I assume that's uh, picking up from analyst notes. Well, uh, we don't have uh, funding at the moment to carry out the phase three studies, which would look to start in the back end of 2022. So we say. Uh, obviously, we are looking for partners who will, uh, that will bring in income or, or income uh, in, term, in, form of, in the form of upfronts and milestones to fund those studies. There's also great opportunities for grant funding in this space. Uh, and also, of course, we could have future equity fundings. Um, we'll have to obviously deliver, as we expect, good phase two data. But in terms of a, a, a shortfall, we're a biotech company funded to 2022. The products we've talked about will not be launched as products until say 2025 so that's when you start to see perhaps those first regularly recurring revenues in advance of that obviously we will be looking for upfront payments as i said through partnerships grant funding and indeed potentially uh, further rounds of equity funding which is normal in a in a sort of maturing biotech such as ourselves and um, there's a couple of questions here where the, the terminology and some of the technical terms are, I'll, I'll try and get right but apologies to the question is if i make any pronunciation errors um, Summit Therapeutics lead compound for C. difficile is currently in phase three versus valomycin for current standard of care. The proposed phase three clinical for NTCDM3 is comparison versus placebo only. When you discussed the phase three program with the FDA, EMEA, and other regulatory agencies, did any of the agencies suggest that you should include the current standard of care, in brackets valomycin, in the phase three trial design? No, because uh, bank of icing, so we're looking to the, our phase three is for the prevention of recurrence of C. diff infection. So this is when somebody has had their first instance of C. difficile infection, they will have already had bank of icing. So in the way the study will work, it's planned, is they will, will already have had one dose of bank of icing to knock back the infection, but then they have the recurrence and then that's when our treatment is used uh, and then you can use placebo as a comparator. So we've had a type C meeting with the FDA, so we've got perfect clarity on that. But I do appreciate uh, uh, the question around the uh, rodinazole with Summit's product is a, a slightly different approach. But ours can be against placebo, as I said, because there will be that use of vancomycin or standard therapy at the time in advance 
uh, of that. So once you've had that first instance, then they would come into our study because we're looking to reduce the recurrence of that first incident, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, and again, the, the next question, I'll try and get this correct. Why doesn't Staph aureus infect ordinary wounds in people with it being in their noses? So my question really is, what is the difference between a surgical wound and a normal wound? Or do people with just a, a cut from you know, doing the cooking end up with a Staph aureus infection? Uh, well, I'm not a medic, but I think you can. Yes, they do. And there are examples of uh, staph infections um, you know, from uh, you know, from nasal carriage outside of the hospital theatre. Uh, we've had discussions uh, with um, in America with uh, recruitment, uh, uh, army recruits, where they have outbreaks of staph infections, uh, where people perhaps you know doing training are knocked about and get cuts and bruises. And again, you have outbreaks there of staph infections. And again, they're looking to decolonize. Uh, the noses of carriers of staff in those large groups of recruits to stop that cross infection. So, um, yes, it can happen through other courses. We're obviously focused on a, a very focused uh, indication here of, of the hospital environment and post surgical infections. Um, hopefully, um, <laughs> yes, you, you, people aren't cutting themselves too badly in kitchens to have a, a high numbers of that type of infection. Um, are you getting support and interest from investors um, with so much focus being on uh, on COVID, uh, COVID and uh, solutions around COVID? Uh, yes, yes. I think we obviously we closed the funding uh, in, in November, December last year. So there was support there. We, we have our own COVID project, um, Sporkov, which is directly targeted at uh, helping with uh, reducing the incidence of uh, viral infections. But also, as I said, that uh, and it's been published now, obviously, there's, there's many um, papers that are coming out from, unfortunately, patients who are going into uh, hospital intensive care units with you know, serious coronavirus infections. At the same time, um, they're picking up bacterial infections, including those caused by staph aureus. So there's been a read across. Uh, and, and, and what's happening is that patients who are in these wars, they're not just having, of course, uh, you know, antiviral treatments. They're also having anti infection, antibacterial infection treatments. So we've seen uh, increased interest in what we're doing uh, from investors and indeed from uh, uh, sort of pharma companies in terms of realizing uh, the opportunity here where perhaps some of the pharma companies have, have backed out of this space for, for many years. I think there's been a, a heightened awareness of this whole area of infection prevention. And a question at the very start, you mentioned uh, GW um, and we've had a, a, over the last few months number of uh, healthcare and biopharma companies looking at NASDAQ or have, have, have added the NASDAQ listing um, is, is, for, for, for the valuations that the companies seem to achieve in these states, uh, I think primarily in investor access. Is that something you've looked at? Is that appropriate or suitable for you? Uh, yes, yes, we looked at it. Actually, in a previous life, we actually acquired a NASDAQ listed company and had to effectively report to NASDAQ um, for two years. So probably have had the reality of actually engaging directly with the SEC and as that is not uh, um, it's not as easy as, as people might think but definitely it's something to look at you need to have a you know you have to have need to have the right market cap uh, to actually sort of get traction once you go across there there are also stories of companies that have gone from the UK where it's not been such a straightforward success so definitely something we look at and definitely you see uh, much more support in, in NASDAQ in the US for uh, I say very ambitious biotech companies that are looking to really build pipelines and also perhaps hold on to the assets for longer uh, you know, and, and even eventually keep hold of assets and market them themselves which is how you of course you arrive at the, the multi-billion dollar valuations how did GW manage to get to that valuation well of course they had great success but also they kept ownership of um, of some of the income streams to justify that valuation and uh, i'm afraid at the moment there aren't great examples of that on aim so definitely as part of our five-year plan it's clearly marked on the strategy paper if i was to share it that you know looking at nasdaq it's something uh, to take seriously but you also need to be realistic about the size of company you need to be to get there um you know you, there's no point going there and being a sort of a micro cap on nasdaq you need to hit the ground running and have, uh, have the capability to deliver the news flow and, and valuation points to really get that sort of multi-hundred million dollar valuations that, you, that you're talking about. Um, I have a question here. Could you spell out or, or as I repeat the, kind of the key news, the key milestones for, for this year? What, what can investors expect to hear over the course of the, uh, the next 10 months? Well, next month, the end of next month, um, phase two data from our XS73 phase two program. So that's a key inflection point. Then obviously we will get that data. We're expected to be positive. We will then uh, finalise phase three plans. I think that'd be quite important uh, news to show where we're going with that asset. 
but at the same time partnering partnering from those two lead clinical assets we have that's other news flow that we're looking to we're looking to deliver partnering deals this year and uh, further progress uh, obviously potential for more grant income uh, but I think that's uh, that's quite a lot as, as is shown in the presentation for us, to, for us to be targeting in 2021 and of course uh, as we found with uh, the projects that we managed to close last year other things will happen from various discussions that are ongoing but um, definitely we have uh, some key news, key news flow a month or so away and then some clear targets then to move forward towards phase three so with our two lead assets which is very exciting. All right. Neil, I think we're out of time there. Um, so thank you very much for joining us and presenting this evening.